And we're back. Welcome to No Direction Beyond, your Starfinder news, reviews, and interviews podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Jefferson J. Thacker, also known as Param, and I'm here joined by... Hi, I'm Alexander Agunis, the Everyman Gamer. And uh, I'm James. I write Code Switch. We're here with author James L. Sutter to talk about his work on the Starfinder Adventure Path Dawn of Flame. James, how are you doing? Doing all right. Thanks for having me on. It's good to have you. We have not had you on the No Direction Network for a while. In fact, you were on what we have affectionately called Episode Zero of No Direction Beyond, which was when we did the huge Starfinder special uh, before you know we launched the sub site. So in oh, a lot right, of ways, right. in a lot of ways, you've got more cred than either of my co-hosts. <laughs> well, Aww. I've definitely been slacking since then, clearly. <laughs> All right. So we're super glad to have you on here. So for those people who might not know <coughs> uh, in our audience, can you please describe your history with Starfinder and why they need to wrap onto every word you say? <laughs> Well, um, with Starfinder in particular, I was the original creative director on the game in charge of launching things. Um, I also wrote Distant Worlds, which was sort of the basis, um, even though that was a Pathfinder book detailing the various planets in uh, Galarian's solar system, that was also the basis for the Starfinder Pact Worlds um, and the Starfinder campaign setting, Um, and probably has something to do with why I ended up becoming creative director of uh, of Starfinder as well. The one was kind of a natural outgrowth of the other. Um, Obviously, there were a ton of people involved with Starfinder, but I got to spearhead that team for the first, you know, the year and a half it took to make it. Um, And I saw that through until uh, about a year and a half ago when I stepped down from Paizo to pursue other writing projects. But of course I'm still writing Starfinder and Pathfinder adventures. And uh, so, you know, source material and monsters and things. So I'm still definitely in the sandbox, but now as a freelancer instead of as the creative director. Now, how did you get involved in production of RPGs to begin with? Oh, well, okay. So um, I was at Paizo for 13 years. Uh, I started, I actually started there when I was 20. Um, I was straight out of college and I had seen, I was working in journalism at the time. I was working, uh, I'd done student newspapers all through college and then I got out of college and I wanted to do, uh, you know, newspaper. I was doing work at various regional papers. Um, But it turns out that the things that I really liked writing about in college, uh, it was very much that sort of gonzo journalism, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And it turns out that there's not a lot of call for that at suburban newspapers. And so I I was looking around for something else to do. And I saw that Amazing Stories, which at the time Paizo ran, Mm -hmm. uh, was looking for an editor-in-chief. And I also saw that they were only over in Redmond, which was, you know, just a few miles from where I was living. So I emailed Lisa out of nowhere and said, hey, I see you're looking for an editor in chief for Amazing Stories. I am totally not qualified for that job, but <laughs> I think that your company is super cool and I am I would love to come in and, you know, do an interview. And uh, apparently she liked my moxie because she brought me in and interviewed me and that, you know, I had a lot of clippings and things from all the various journalistic and fiction work that I'd done to that point. Um, And she said, well, you know, we don't have an editorial position open, but let me see what I can do. And so my first job at Paizo was finding images for the Paizo.com web store when that was first getting launched at a Nikola JPEG. And so that was... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that was my, uh, you know, designated Googler was pretty much my my job title for the first couple of months. And then I became the editorial intern and then I became the customer service rep and then on and so forth until I ended up working as an uh, editor and developer on Dungeon Magazine. And I did that right up until the magazines went away and then became a developer, became an editor, became managing editor in charge of the editorial team, like did kind of a little bit of everything. Um, I ran the Pathfinder Tales line. Um, I helped, you know, along with obviously Eric Mona, the publisher and other folks, um, launched that. So I got to pick all the authors and develop all the novels for that. Um, And just kind of 
worked in a whole bunch of different interesting elements of the development of Pathfinder. And then when Starfinder came around, um, you know, lots of people were very invested in it, but uh, the, it had a special place in my heart because I'd been working on the planets for years at that point. Mm -hmm. And so Eric gave me the nod to be creative director and things went from there. Now you do mention that you worked, you, you were responsible for distant worlds and that yeah. really is the where Starfinder has its roots what inspired that product why did you want to tackle tackle that particular book well i had been trying to it was actually a book that i pitched to eric um and the rest of the team um because i'd been wanting to get more science fiction into pathfinder from the very beginning so uh actually I think that my earliest memory of that is in Pathfinder Adventure Path, the third volume of that, when we did the big Gazetteer of Verissia, um, when we were just starting to detail the campaign setting. Um, James Jacobs had come up with Verissia and drawn the map um, and done you know work on Sandpoint and stuff like that. But he really didn't have a whole lot of uh, tags for the rest of the map. You know, He knew kind of what was in... Uh, Sandpoint, and I think he knew some stuff about like Magnamar and a little bit broad strokes, the rest of it. Um, but uh, I got the assignment to write the Gazetteer and really fill in that map. And so I was adding, you know, 50 new locations to that map. And uh, you know, in the process, adding things like, you know, Karamaga and very, you know, Erglin, various other things that would turn out to be pretty important later on. Uh, but at the time, I had just gone nuts and I put in science fiction stuff, and James Jacobs and Wes Schneider had to sit me down and go, okay, like, we, it's not that it's a bad idea, but you can't have a space elevator in Verissia. Like this is a <laughs> this is a fantasy game, so just slow your roll, maybe someday. Um, and that was, I can't remember which one that was. I think that was maybe what, like, the the Spire of Lemris or something was originally going to be a space elevator. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, that you know, I, I put that away. But it had always been something I really wanted to do. I've always loved science fiction. I, I love the blending of science fiction and fantasy. Uh, so I was always poking little bits in wherever I could. Um, and then I knew that, you know... Eric Mona really loved the old pulps. We were working on planet stories, um, reprinting old pulp novels. And, uh, you know, he had sort of come up with Castrovel and Akaton as sort of like the red planet, green planet analogs. Um, but we knew we had, you know, a whole bunch of other planets in the solar system. And so I said, hey, can I, can I tackle this? Like, I'll take, you know, the couple we've already got an idea about. You know, I think... I think when I started that, we only knew about Castrovel, Akaton, and we knew about Octurn, because Octurn had been introduced, the whole Octurn Enigma idea, as sort of the farthest out planet. Um, but we didn't know what any of the other planets were. Um, and so I pitched that book. Eric said, yeah, go for it. And then a lot of the inspiration for the individual worlds came sort of 50-50 from fantasy tropes, like, uh, you know, Triaxis was me very much saying like, well, where's our pern? You know, like we need dragon riders somewhere, you know, that kind of thing. Or like Eox, the idea of an undead world where the atmosphere has all been burned off. Um, but also a lot of it was inspired by real world science as well. Um, you know, I really, I've always liked astronomy. I'm a total amateur, but I enjoy it. And so the ideas of things like, well, what if you had a tidally locked planet where one side is always facing the sun, you know, that... That could be really interesting. That, of course, inspired Versace. Um, and then, you know, actually, the, uh, the I mean, a lot of them have some, like, Abalon is kind of like Mercury in a way. Um, but the idea of, like, what could live on Mercury? Well, you've got all this solar energy. Robots would be great there, you know. Um, you've got solar energy and metals, you know. Um, so trying to go off stuff like that. But actually, Eox um, was inspired almost entirely by this story, which may be, uh, may be not true, but uh, the idea that when they were setting off the first atomic bomb test, there was this fear that it might ignite the atmosphere and just, like, set all of Earth's oxygen on fire because um, they just didn't know. And so I love that idea of, well, what if that actually happened? Like, what if that, if that had happened, you'd had just this, like, 
you know, global holocaust as a result of firing some doomsday weapon, um, you know, who would survive? Well, obviously liches, right? Um, so a lot of stuff was just inspired by different uh, different things like that. Or, you know, um, uh, for Triaxis, you know, in addition to being the fantasy inspiration there was obviously Pern and the Dragon Realms and things like that. But also, at the same time, the idea of what about a planet with a really eccentric orbit that sometimes is closer to the sun and sometimes is farther away? And I will say to, to either my credit or my shame, I'm not sure which one, I had designed the entire planet with the idea of like these very long seasons, um, you know, where you have two entirely distinct ecosystems that pop up. Uh, during the two various seasons. And I was putting the fin- finishing touches on the article um, and saying something like, you know, uh, and the people, you know, the summer born people always know that they have to be careful because winter is kind of, oh, damn it. <laughs> like, as I realized that this is Game of Thrones. <laughs> but uh, but I maintain that I, I got there from first principles, from astronomical principles. So, George Martin, it's not my fault. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> <That's> so funny. <laughs> well, speaking of Triaxis, I have a question about Triaxis. Yeah, um, it has a summer and a winter phase. Why when? Why are we back to winter again? Like, why did you pick that point in time to come back to Triaxis with in Starfinder? Um, you know, it was one of those things where you kind of just had to flip a coin. Um, you know, either it was going to be summer, or it was going to be winter, and I think that the uh, the Triaxians look more interesting in their winter phase. Like they're they're much more elfy in the summer phase, and so it just made a way for them to be more sort of distinct. Also, we already had, you know, I didn't know how long it would be until we really got to detail Triaxis, and so being able to use the old Pathfinder Gazetteer as a starting place um, seemed like it could be useful for GMs. Um, obviously, things have changed a lot since then. But, uh, you know, I didn't want to have the slate entirely wiped clean the way it might be if it were set during summer. So, but really it was one of those could have gone either way. This is a good time to say that we do these episodes live in front of a Twitch audience every Wednesday at nine o'clock PM Eastern time. Uh, that would be six o'clock PM. PST or Paso Standard Time for those of you keeping track. <laughs> and if you have any questions during the episode and you're viewing us live, get them in and we will forward them to our guests and ourselves as appropriate. And speaking of yeah. which, King of Rock has a question. All right. Uh, he wants to know what James, he wants to know, well, James L. Sutter, because we've got <laughs> the double duty on James today. Uh, I'll kick it to Sutter. the other James if I don't know the answer. <laughs> he, <laughs> he wants to know. Might know. He's played every society game already. Wow. <laughs> King of Rock wants to know, what is your favorite of the worlds in the Pact Worlds? Oh, God. This, this really is one of those, like, how can you pick among your children? Like, mm-hmm. I actually think it's harder because I feel like, you know, you often know which child is really your favorite. At least mm-hmm. I'm assuming. Um, I don't have any children. Perhaps it's good that I don't have any children since that's my outlook. Um, no, oh, God. Let's see. Maybe. Maybe Versace. Um, I think just because I really like the. Uh, the various different biomes caused by that title locking. Um, and I like that they're super technologically advanced. I feel like it's, of all the planets, it's maybe the one that lets us get sort of the farthest away from sort of traditional Pathfinder in that it's the most, like, one of the most tech heavy. Um, and it's, it's sort of a fun, like, shadow runny kind of feel. Um, but also, I really like that you've got that. Uh, yeah, you've, you've just got a lot to play with. You've got essentially three different worlds in one there. Um, and I also like the fact that they've got kind of like a a one-world government thing going on that's actually kind of functional. Um, like, I feel like it's one of the less dystopian places. Like, I, I love dystopias. I love playing in dystopias and writing dystopias. But I feel like you need some utopian stuff in there to get... Uh, to get some balance, right? Like, and I feel like a lot of stuff in Versace actually works reasonably well. 
What is what? Oh no! What am I? Alex, I am come on validated. in. Validated. Yes. Yes, we did an what? entire episode where I tried to posit the idea that the Pack Worlds was a dystopia, and they both told me wrong. And here you are saying that most of it is dystopic. Well, yes. I mean, it's not. I mean, let's face it. It is a. It is a Asterisk. capitalist. It's a super capitalist anarchic system, right? Like, and I'm not sure that. Uh, I'm not sure that you can get a utopia with capitalism, right? Like, so, uh, you know, I guess let's let's get political right away. But like, right, that's one of the one of the only reasons Star Trek is so happy most of the time. Like, at least next gen, is that it's there's no money. Like, everybody's just kind of doing it for the love. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't say that the packed worlds are dystopian in general i feel like it's more sort of a wild west uh mentality which has very dystopian aspects but also there's a lot of opportunity and sort of that uh that idea of like oh you can do anything you can rise up but like but but part of the thing of is if you want to have everybody feel like oh you can rise up and rise above you know your station and all those things that necessitates like but by necessity that means that you're starting out somewhere that's not super great right like or else you wouldn't be driven to go expand and do stuff and find your destiny in the same way right so um you know i think i think absalom station does a fine job i think that the stewards are doing their best like i don't think that the packed worlds are necessarily a dystopia as compared to our modern <laughs> our modern societies i but, would uh, love for you to someday listen to that episode and tell us what you think about it interesting yeah but but so i guess uh so the long story that's a long way around saying uh i'm gonna say versus is my favorite the, actually the the truth is i was already uh like thirty thousand words into a novel set on a planet very similar to versus when i got the distant world's uh, book assignment so I kind of scrapped that novel which wasn't going very well anyway and like moved all the things that I liked most about that into Versace and so uh, so that's probably the world that I had been thinking about for the longest you know when you, when that question was asked I was going to guess that your favorite world was um, the one the Barathus are from with the giant space whales that wow, just seems I- that just I do like very, love the uh, James L. Sutter world. I do love the gas giants, and I really love, um, I, I love them really alien planets, right? Like I think mm-hmm. while there's a lot of fun to be had in the various pulp worlds, um, you know the the red and green planet and the other classic stuff. I really like, uh, actually, you know, speaking of speaking of utopia like i like the cooperative aspect of the barathu where they have to sort of combine in order to solve problems like into whole new entities um i just think that that's really fun and alien and for me the whole point of a a science fiction game is to get to play with the alien and you know meet cultures that are truly different rather than just these are humans with weird ears (laughs) The weirdest ears. Not that not that we don't have plenty of weird ear humans, right? Like I was just I was just saying yeah. the Triaxians are like half furry, half weird ear humans. Like it's I I understand, but that's funny. So uh we heard that you uh wrote something really big and cool for Starfinder recently. Yeah, yeah. I mean the weird thing is not actually that recently. It was like a year ago for me, but it's finally coming out. Um, but yeah, I got to, uh, kick off the Dawn of Flame adventure path by writing the first issue, uh, which is titled Firestarters, which is absolutely a prodigy reference. Um, (laughs) and, uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed getting to kick that off. I always love low level adventures. Like to me, there's nothing I enjoy more than writing a first level adventure. Um, just because Anything can kill you. Everything is so scary. Um, And everything is the first time somebody's seen it, at least theoretically. Um, So I I was glad that they trusted me enough to let me let me kick that one off. And uh, I got to do some really fun stuff in there. I got to design a starship, Uh, I guess, uh, spoilers, very minor spoilers, but I got to design a starship dungeon from the plane of fire. And so... For me, 
even just like the mapping process of sitting down and mapping out, okay, what does a genie starship look like? You know, how is it different from all these other designs? Because I think it's important that the architecture be different, the amenities be different. Um, and how do you blend magic and technology, right? Like which elements of the ship are going to be tech-based and which ones are going to be, you know, the result of some bound elemental or something. And so uh, answering those questions, let me create that first, uh, the first dungeon of the adventure, um, which for me was probably the highlight. So hopefully, uh, ho hopefully we hit people really fast with, uh, you know, my, my favorite parts of the game. Um, and, uh, and that that gives people a flavor of what's to come. So, here's a question. James and I are almost on Dead Sons. James is our GM. And okay. In the near future, we're looking for a new adventure path to play, and we're sort of between Signal of Screams and Attack of the Swarm. What, based on this first level adventure, why do you think we should consider Dawn of Flame instead? Oh, God. I mean, I can't, I can't really argue against other APs. I mean, the Swarm... I'm, I'm going to be totally honest and say, like, I would have loved to write for the Swarm. I'm really curious. I haven't gotten to read the the Swarm Adventures yet, but, like, that seems like such an amazingly epic AP. And it's only three volumes long, right? So you've got to... Comparatively quickly, you could get through that. Um, I don't know, man. I think it might be a tough call between that and Dawn of Flame. Uh, but Dawn of Flame definitely... The, so on the flip side, you get to go into the sun. Like you've probably <laughs> never done that before in in an RPG. So you know, follow your heart. There's not really a bad choice here. But is following my heart into the sun really a good idea? Okay, maybe there are bad choices. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go. Let's look. Like Alex, you were you were excited about space whales uh, earlier. Yes. James, but tell us a, tell us about the space whale. There is definitely a space whale in the very first encounter of, of this adventure, which I will point out uh, was actually not me, even though space whales were a thing that I, you know, uh, was saying all the time back in the day. Uh, the, this adventure actually came with a pretty heavy outline from the Starfinder staff. So now whether they put a space whale in there knowing that I would be writing it. I, I have no idea, but um, but I appreciate their taste in doing so. So yeah, it's a space whale from the plane of fire, um, in a starship combat. So <laughs> it's, I I giggled gleefully when I read that part. Can can I ask a question then? Sure. Does that mean that there is outer space in the plane of fire? Is that um, a, is that like a spoiler? Because like, I mean. Because, like, I was always picturing the plane of fire as, like, one incongruous, like, flat plane where everything was lit on fire. But, like, is there actually, like, can I get into a, a spaceship and fly around, like, the elemental plane? So like, is I, space just burning I mean, air? I don't know. I assumed, I've always assumed that the planes, like, that, they're, that they have edges, but also I think it depends what they bump up against. Now, whether there's a void in there akin to space i'm not sure but uh yeah I, I don't know i can't i couldn't tell you an authoritative canon answer since uh I, and i should point out for everybody uh i am no longer on staff so nothing <laughs> i say is canon anything can be contradicted <laughs> by anybody at paizo at any time mm -hmm. um so it's just my opinion yeah because there is that adventure in um pathfinder society scenario where you go to the plane of earth and there's definitely a ceiling yeah yes. right mm -hmm. uh, hmm. yeah but i i don't know i don't know how it works like i sort of assume that the planes because they're sort of infinite i assume yeah. that there are pockets of everything in there if that makes sense like i assume that if you've got you know the plane of water there's going to be a place where you know there's sort of a sea floor and there's going to be a place where there's you know where it, a surface where it like meets air and whatnot but but that those things won't necessarily be consistent, right? Maybe it's like um, a circle that goes through different things. Like, yeah, I mean, I I can't remember. I think there might have been a thing about which planes, which other planes it touches. But it's all it starts to get very theoretical and metaphysical, where you're like, oh, these things are coterminous, and these things are not coterminous, and they're infinite, but they're also bounded, right? And so it's like, well, I, like 
that is metaphysical speak for do whatever you want, <laughs> like, in, in my opinion. So space in the plane of fire is just behind the plane of fire, still so inside of it. King of <laughs> sure, yeah. that the Blood of the Elements book has like a map that puts the planes in order, and he says that fire sits on top of Earth and sits below the astral plane. So maybe astral plane is like fires out. I, I don't know. So if if someone I don't know, from, man. If yeah, someone else from there. That's all I know. Yeah. But the, we, can, the we can all is... agree that the moment the whale enters the material plane, it is now a space whale. Right. Yeah, it could true. have just been a regular yes. whale that moved. That's a fine. This point. is not a regular been... whale. Well, you know, regular space whale that like moved. You know, it found good. Listen, in, it was yeah, by James L. Sutter. It can't be a regular whale. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be a something whale. Yeah, it's, fair. It's, it, it has good taste in real estate. You know, that's all. <laughs> I like that we I mean, also get the ground stats for the whale and the space stats. It's a CR sixteen if you fight this whale hand to hand with blasters. Um, wait, really? Yeah, in and it's the a, adventure. Yeah, in the back. You can't do it in the adventure, but in the back oh, it gets okay. the stats yeah, yeah. for the space whale. <laughs> if you just want to kill yeah. the players. <laughs> yeah, because you just got to gotta figure out a way, because somebody's going to launch themselves out of the port tube right on the whale's back. Um, <laughs> it turns out that was a big mistake, because that whale is floating in space and on fire. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> but it's only a tier one-fourth starship. Well, I mean, it is, oh. it is fundamentally a whale, right? And okay. it's also, like... It's an encounter that sets the scene more than, uh, you know, TPKs. So hopefully people can handle it fairly handily. But uh, okay. but you never know. It might well, get lucky. Well, space wells yeah. aside, what is the, the central pitch of Dawn of Flame? And how does it fit in the overall theme of, uh, sorry, um, what is the pitch of Firestarters? And how does it fit in the overall theme of Dawn of Flame? Well, so it kicks off. Uh, it kicks everything off where basically the idea, and again, there's going to be spoilers here. Um, the idea is that for a long time, people have lived in the Burning Archipelago, um, which is this magical bubble city that nobody quite understands how it works. Um, that's on the sun, like on the surface of the sun. But there's always been sort of these theories that there are other cultures deeper inside the sun. But nobody's really been able to verify that yet. And it's kind of a kooky fringe theory. Um, and so in this story, like the, uh, the Lashunta, uh, who live in, um, the burning archipelago have been getting this weird sort of uneasy, uh, like vibe for quite a while, um, that seems to be emanating from deeper in the sun. Um, and it turns out that it's actually, you find out much later that it's sort of a distress beacon from one of these cultures in, farther down, but like. Basically, the plot of the adventure is that uh, a powerful outsider on the plane of fire has decided to invade the material plane and take over the sun. Um, and that's going to include taking over the burning archipelago, but just like conquering massive amounts of territory. And the sort of the first shot in all of this is when you get uh, when you there's this portal called the, called the far portal that this space whale comes through. And the reason it comes through is because it's chasing a spaceship from a defector who is trying to warn the Pact Worlds that this invasion is coming. So you as the PCs accidentally in intercept this warning that things are about to go bad. Um, and then uh, from there, the whole adventure path is you trying to sort of stop this Efridi invasion before they can take over the sun. Mm -hmm. um, but so in my adventure in particular, uh, you, you know, the first part is uh, you take over this starship or you, you have to go sort of explore this starship that's uh, that the Afridi have been trying to take over before it could warn, uh, warn everybody out in the Pact Worlds. Um, so you sort of fight your way through there, and then you go to the Burning Archipelago, but when you get to the Burning Archipelago, you find out that uh, the Afridi have actually set up agitators um, in the Burning Archipelago. You know, they've, they've got spies, they've been doing their research, um, and it's helped foment this rebellion in the Lashunta section of the city. And so that whole bubble in the bubble city has closed itself off um, and sort of this fascist militia has taken over. And so if you want to be able to learn what's going on and warn people, you need to first uh, infiltrate uh, this area and stop this rebellion and free the, free the citizenry, um, including... 
the the key scientist that you need to tell you about all these things that are coming. Mm -hmm. um, so it's <laughs> it's weird because it's also especially given when I wrote it, um, it's partially you know a, a dungeon romp through these various uh, these various structures, both the spaceship and in the Burning Archipelago, various neighborhoods of that. Um, but also, like, there is definitely uh, some... Some of my thoughts about modern politics may have crept through <laughs> slightly. <laughs> um, just because it is about sort of like an uprising of a fascist... Uh, uh, fascist pseudo-populist movement uh, that's all based on fear of outsiders and trying to, you know, like... Lashunta, you know, trying to protect this area for Lashuntas as it's supposed to be, blah, 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 you know. Um, and I think that's something that I, especially in a modern game, but even in Pathfinder, like, I've never really shied away from trying to explore interesting and difficult, you know, social ideas, philosophical concepts. Um, in fact, I probably that's something that <laughs> is fairly... Uh, kind of a tell for me like i now that i think about it probably most of the things that i've written for pathfinder or starfinder have various threads of that in there um right but like like for instance uh when i was writing about absalom station originally um i put very much sort of an alt-right group in there uh and you know you could say oh god why why would you do that like i play games to escape this stuff but i mean i think that that's <laughs> I think that dealing with those issues uh, is really important. And like, spoiler, they're not the good guys, right? Like, I think that <laughs> it is important to be able to fight fight the real bad guys, right? Uh, and like, you know, for a long time, the trope was, uh, you know, everybody was fighting Nazis, um, you know, from Indiana Jones, you know, to whoever. It was always either Nazis or thinly veiled Nazis. Um, and... Frankly, that feels more pertinent than ever now that that's coming back around again. And so, uh, I, you know, I felt fortunate that uh, I was able to play with that a little bit in this adventure as well. Is that what has been attracting you to sci-fi so much? The fact that sci-fi often plays in this space of reflecting culture and philosophy. I mean, I think that when fantasy's done right, fantasy does it too. But yeah, like I think both of those. Um, you know, it can be, uh, I'm trying to think about this because I read a really interesting piece recently, I think from N.K. Jemison that was saying that actually science fiction's tradition of dealing with things like racism through the lens of aliens and other things is actually kind of bad because it means that as a genre, we've stopped engaging with those things directly, right? When you, know, and she was sort of saying like, look, yes, you can portray racism through, you know, like how people treat the aliens, but you could also just have racism flat out and deal with that in your book, right? Like, you know, you don't, not everything has to be a subtle metaphor or illusion. Like sometimes you can just talk about the problems. Um, and I think that that's, uh, that is a good point that I've been thinking about a lot recently, but yeah, I traditionally, my feeling has always been like, science fiction fantasy lets us deal with these big uh, thorny concepts in ways that we might not be able to talk about as easily um, in a real world context. You know, it lets you sort of get past people's guard a little bit. Um, and that's why I love writing about, you know, um, for instance, the redemption engine, my, uh, my second novel for Pathfinder tales was all about consent and free will and the sort of, the way those play into our morality system, like talking about alignment and morality in Pathfinder and Starfinder is super interesting to me because on the one hand, you know, I, I fall closer to like in my, in my own personal opinion, I feel like uh, absolute good and absolute evil is often a very sticky, uh, uh, hard to find kind of thing. And that usually everything is, more shades of gray, but here we've got this world where there are absolute good creatures and absolute evil creatures, but also they have no consent and they have no free will. So if they have no free will, can they really be good or evil if they're not making choices to be so? You know, like those sorts of questions I find really fascinating. Or right, uh, 
Hermea, you know, with Menkari is like, uh, you know, that that's always ruffled some feathers for people, like hopefully in a good way, um, because he's a dragon who's literally practicing eugenics. Like he is trying to breed the perfect human, um, which is terrible in like a real world context, but also he's a dragon. And if dragons are so much better than humans, like, but, you know, statistically and culturally and all these things, then is it really that different than like, is a dragon breeding people any different than humans breeding dogs? Right. And also like in that case, all the humans in Hermea have signed a contract to be there. So like, if it's consensual, is it really a problem? You know, like, I'm not saying one way or another, but like James Jacobs and I had a long running and fairly public message board feud about, okay, he's a gold dragon, but he's doing this thing. Is he actually good or is he not? Um, and, you know, we, I always was a big fan of never saying whether he was good or not. Um, but we both like sort of represented the two, uh, the two viewpoints of, I'm not saying that he was good, but I'm saying that, having people wonder and question whether or not he can actually be good if he's doing these things, as long as he has everyone's consent, like that's a really interesting conversation that even if you ultimately decide, no, he's not, he's a villain. You need to go after him. I think the fact that you thought through why he's a villain is really important. You know, I, I've always said that if your heroes aren't questioning why they're doing what they're doing, they're probably not the heroes, right? Like, I, th- I think that anytime you say, well, we're good and they're evil and therefore we're going to do X, um, like that thinking really quickly leads you down the path to doing some pretty neutral or or downright evil things um, just in the name of self-righteousness. So, uh, yeah, I love playing with morality. Mm. <laughs> Redemption Engine is so good, too. Mm-hmm. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, Anybody who's listening, one. please go buy it. Yeah, or Death's Heretic, either one. Yeah, but I, I think they're both, both available on Audible if podcast listeners yeah. like audio. Um, and, of course, the soft covers. Actually, it's really hard to get hold of uh, your, your first one, Death's Heretic. I think they might be both, like, sold out slash mm-hmm. out of print. But mm-hmm. I think, I mean, you can probably still find them on Amazon or used or something, but... Obviously, the ebook and the audiobook never go out of print. Um, and they're both, the audiobook is super well done. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Justin Riddler asks in chat Can we have Starfinder Tales? I'm going to intercept that will answer as uh, James L. Sutter has no say in whether or not we have Starfinder Tales. And we currently don't even have Pathfinder Tales. It's all on hold yeah. until we get more news. I, I hope so. I really, yeah. really hope so. Yeah. I would also love to see Starfinder comics. Um, mm-hmm. You know, all of these things. Uh, I I have my, my fingers crossed, so we'll just have to wait and see. Mm-hmm. So here's a question. Yeah? In your opinion, because Salim technically can't die until Phrasma says he can die, mm-hmm. do you think that he's around in Starfinder? Did he disappear with Galarian, or did he get let off the hook long before Starfinder? Oh, man, so... I will tell you, and I won't tell you what happens in it, but so that would have been answered by the third book in... So I always considered um, Salim's story to be a trilogy. Um, And so I had a third novel pretty well uh, outlined uh, at the point at which Pathfinder Tales went away. Um, So it was going to answer a lot of things. You were going to find out... uh, some things about what happened to Neela from the first uh, the first book. You were going to find out some things about Salim and his future, whether or not he stays uh, stays immortal, whether or not he goes onward. Um, so that uh, obviously that book never came out. I don't know if we'll ever get to actually write it. Uh, I would love to. It seems pretty unlikely at this point. But um, yeah, so I feel like I feel like we can't say. I feel mm-hmm. like without having written that story, I don't want to make uh, make his final decision for him unless uh, unless he gets to have that whole process of getting there. I need this book, James. <laughs> I know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to it was, all it, it, of people listening, <laughs> I need this book. 
Someday, man. Someday, it'd be it'd be super interesting if it was the first novel in Starfinder Tales too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Like still around. <laughs> That could be know, horrible, I, though, because then he wouldn't remember any like a lot of the things he did in the first two books. Yeah, how like, much yeah. would the how much would the gap mess you up? Well, so he would probably remember what happened uh, from those first two books because, right, like people in the Starfinder universe, they largely do have records of the Pathfinder era because that was before the gap. I mean, they don't have a lot of them, but, like, there's no reason why they can't find records from that era. It's sort of that space between the Pathfinder era and the Starfinder era that's gone. So he would probably remember the first two novels and then have a giant blank space, which would probably be super upsetting. Um, although, may, I don't know. The point at which you're immortal, maybe it's less upsetting than it would be to somebody else. Um, because you're just like, whatever. That's time gone. I've got a lot of time, you know, like... So not only but, uh, does this novel need to happen, it needs to be listed as part 47 of the Selene trilogy. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, perfect. All right, so um, I want to know about all the other Starfinder Adventure Paths are following, uh, they're doing a lot of unique things, but they're following a lot of the expected sci-fi tropes that we you know we've got our evil empire one we've got our space horror one we've got the giant swarm thing coming um we had the big intro uh focusing on the starfinder society the sun one stands out as the weird one why Good. did you all decide you know where we should go the sun you know i actually don't know because i was already out by the time that they made that decision mm -hmm. um that was actually the first i believe that was the first uh, AP that they decided what they were going to do after I had left. Um, so I didn't know what they were going to do next. Um, and then they came and said, hey, we're going into the sun. You want to play? And I, Sure, that sounds great. Um, <laughs> and also, you got out and they dragged you back in. Yeah. No, no, it was actually, it was really nice. And I was glad, you know, you never know when you leave something like this, whether or not uh, the folks who are now in charge are going to still want to you know, bring you back to play or whether they're going to go cool Sutter is finally gone so we can stop like having all of his dumb ideas messing up our game you know so I was really uh flattered and pleased that they brought me back in to play um but now that I'm a freelancer I really gotta you know make sure that I'm really on my game and uh and make sure that they want to keep hiring me because <laughs> um, I'd love to keep writing more I have some tinfoil hat about why the fourth one's in the sun the fourth Pathfinder AP was Legacy of Fire, and this is a four star Finder. Whoa! AP. Yeah. Whoa! Interesting. It's I off. like your, I like your tinfoil hat theory. I think that's a very <laughs> smart theory. Um, I also think this one is interesting because, in a lot of ways, it sounds almost like the Starfinder version of Second Darkness, in the sense that, like, Second Darkness is about finding a creature that everyone thought might exist, but it was kind of the mm. man. And then here comes Path of Fire. Something might be in the sun. Let's explore it. And it yeah. No, that's interesting. You know, and I hadn't even thought about it, but like Legacy of Fire had all sorts of, you know, genie stuff and whatnot. This one is all genies and stuff too. Yeah. Wow. Go to I don't the know if of I fire. Meet the city of, go to the city of brass. Yeah, man. I don't know if that was a factor, <laughs> but uh, it sure is some synchronicity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hey, maybe there's a character later on that's like, you know, still an elemental. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Somebody's. <laughs> it could be. They're if they're if they're immortal. It, yeah. Man, I wonder if there's time. <laughs> I should like hang up on this call and call them and be like, we need to rename one of the genies immediately. You know, <laughs> like, we need to rename. It. Stop the presses. Oh. Yeah, anything anything that hasn't gone to press yet. We need so um justin peace letter asked a question that helped me that'll help us transition here uh, he wants to know where they can find your published fiction since the redemption engine so uh, what are you doing now that you are a freelancer well i'm doing a lot of different stuff um so i'm you know i've been working on some creator-owned novels that nothing anybody can buy yet but uh i signed with a new literary agent and hopefully we'll be selling some of those soon uh I've got a science fiction thriller and a sort of sword and sorcery literary slice of life uh, ennui and monsters kind of book. 
Um, so we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens with those. Nothing to announce at this time. Uh, but I've also been doing um, some comics work. I got to do uh, a bonus story for if anybody knows Schlock Mercenary, which is a really long running web comic uh, science fiction. Um, it was actually one of the comics we cited in the back of the Starfinder Core rulebook. Um, I got to do a bonus story for that that'll come out, I think, next year. So that'll be fun. Um, I got to do some work for Tyler Walpole, uh, who is one of the artists that's done a bunch of stuff for Pathfinder over the years. Um, he was putting together an art book and so asked me to write a bunch of short stories set in his world based on each of the pictures. And so I got to write just little like little world building fiction snippets for his art book, which is coming out soon. Um, so it's been just a lot of different small things. But if anybody ever wants to find my stuff, um, just my website is jameslsutter.com or I'm on Twitter at, at James L. Sutter. Uh, and I've got all of my short stories that I've published linked there, including a bunch of free ones and free audio ones, um, along with the novels and comics work. Um, actually, one of the most recent pieces of fiction that I've been doing is right now I'm in the middle of a series of every week on the Paizo blog. They're doing these things called Iconic Encounters, which is, uh, you know, we, they, we were talking about it and they were saying, well, we'd love to do the Meet the Iconics again, but everybody's already met the Iconics. So what do we do? So they decided to bring me back and every year or every week is a piece of flash flash fiction featuring a different iconic and showcasing some element of the rules that for second edition, which is something that is different that a player can do now that they couldn't do before. Um, but as part of, as part of the fun of it, they're not saying which thing that they're showcasing. So they're just having me, they tell me, here's the rule we want showcased. Here's a cool piece of art, write a story with this character or a scene that links these things um and then if you once you have the core rule book in you know six months here uh you'll be able to go back and see potentially puzzle out like which of the rules was being depicted here but i'm trying to do it in such a way that it still feels very natural and both like the stories that you could tell with first edition but, but doing some things that are a little bit different for second edition as well um and it's just, it's been so fun to write these characters again. Because I used to write, um, if you'll remember in the first edition of Pathfinder, there were in every core rule book, or every book in the core rule book line, there would be those chapter openers that had an image and then just a little fiction snippet of sort of describing what was happening with the various characters. Mm -hmm. um, and I got to write probably 95% of those over mm -hmm. the. Uh, over the life of Pathfinder 1. Um, and it was really fun. And for a long time before the comics, it was the only way we really got to ex experience the characters' personalities at all. Um, so I really relished that chance to uh, to kind of build up their personalities a couple hundred words at a time. Um, which, you know, incidentally, probably, like, went on to have a big influence on, like, the comic flavor and whatnot. And I remember somebody early on asking why are the adventurers always so snarky to each other? Like, why are they always making fun of each other? It's like, well, that's what I love in an adventure. Like, that's my favorite part of being in an adventuring party in a game is like talking smacks to the other players and making jokes. And so uh, I think that infected uh, the personalities of all the different characters as well. I mean, haven't they seen the Avengers? That's what happens there too. Yeah, right? Like, I mean, it's it's sort of a classic part of any adventuring party novel uh, or story, but uh, but I really enjoy that part. Mm -hmm. Talking smack is fun. It just gets a little bit out of hand when that smack turns into getting stabbed by a rogue with 3d6 sneak attack dice. Are you I mean being here? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Never mind. Sorry, Pam, what were you saying? So didn't he mean sneak attack? Not um, uh, trick attacks by an operative? No, I was referring to our Reign of Winter campaign. Oh. <laughs> yeah, before we got to Triaxis. All right. I uh, see this is an ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we actually won that adventure. Our characters went from him stabbing and almost killing me to basically <laughs> gripping and holding each other, screaming <laughs> while Avana tried to murder us all. Nice. <laughs> any, ga any game that involves the players screaming is a choice game. It's a very good AP. 
<laughs> now, now, code yeah. switch, James. We've got some more evidence that supports your tinfoil hat theory. Hmm. That like you Which saw is? in chat. Oh, yeah, about um, Rob McCurry having his first um, AP rating experience being in Legacy of Fire, mm. and he also writes in this one. Yeah, that could be. Mm -hmm. It's that, like I mean, Rob McCleary is setting up all the dominoes. I mean, he wrote the final book. I mean, that's kind mm -hmm. of an important one of most APs. Yeah, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Except for Raina Winner. Uh, no, the fifth book really... is the important one in Raina Winner. And so the fifth book is like the the Gonzo memorable book. But I think yeah. the sixth book is still really important. Yeah, the sixth book has your implication for what happens or doesn't happen mm. about your party succeeding. You don't save the world until you beat book six. Yeah. That's <laughs> true. Although I do think, like, when we decided we were going to do the whole Rasputin thing, um, I honestly, I would say that was one of the times I've seen the staff most excited. Um, you know, kind of like... Honestly, similar to when we decided to do Starfinder, um, like there are those moments you, when you spend every day doing this stuff, it becomes it becomes a job. It becomes very uh, not jaded, but like you just you get used to making all these decisions, and so you remember those instances when something makes an entire room sort of giggle and be like, "Oh my god, really? no, we can't do that. Can we really do that?" You know. Um, <laughs> And I think that actually Starfinder and, you know, and the Rasputin adventure and a bunch of these things came out of that spirit of what if we did something that's like maybe a little bit crazy, but it would just be so much fun. And it's something that we want to do, you know, and maybe it's jumping the shark, but maybe it's maybe that's what you need. Right. Um, and it turns out that I think one of the lessons that I took away and that I know some other staff members took away from all those years of working on this stuff is that if the developers are excited about it, the fans will also be excited about it. Like that, that love comes through. And so you can't make a product. Like if you make a product that nobody is championing and nobody's really excited about, it's going to flop or it's going to do just like well enough. But when you do a project, even when it's a weird project, like, if it's weird and niche, but you love it, the fans will really be into it. I mean, that's certainly been my experience. Like, most of the uh, books that I've done that were, you know, solo campaign setting books, it's always been the weird stuff, right? You know, I did City of Strangers, uh, detailing Karamaga. I did Distant Worlds, um, you know, doing the solar system. I did the, uh, the First World, uh, you know, Gazetteer campaign setting book. Um, and all of those are like fairly niche things, you know, they're not super broadly applicable to everybody's campaign, but they were things that I was really passionate about and that I wanted to, you know, dive in and spend six months really getting into it. Um, and I think that like judging by the way, you know, fans have responded to me, like maybe there are people who never pick it up, but the people who do pick it up love it because it's the, because it comes through. Um, and I know that that's happened with other staff. You know, I know, you know, Wes being the gothic horror, you know, guy that he is, you know, like rule of fear from him, like that was a labor of love and you could see it, you know, like there's, I feel like every staff member has had that experience of, oh, this was, this was the thing where it wasn't just an assignment. This was a passion project where I could connect with the audience. Um, and I think the more you can lean into that, the better your games are going to be. Just wait, James. There's something like that coming up in Strange Aeons in book six, and I'm so excited for you. Yeah? Yeah. Interesting. Don't, don't tell him if you know, James. Don't tell him if you know what's in book six. I, I, think can't, I, I, I can't wait for it to find me and make me fail a will save. <laughs> <laughs> so he says that as his, as his barbarian's only weakness. The number of will saves I've made him do is comparatively small. I'm just Except surprised you... I'm surprised okay. you brought a barbarian into Strange Aeons. <laughs> no, no, it, it was great. He did a good job. And, you know, last <laughs> last adventure, he got hit by a murderous ally and had to spend a round trying to chop one of his two bards up. It was good. And I've never seen them more nice. afraid and rules learning how it works. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, murderous Command is one of those spells that, like, nobody really likes until they watch their party barbarian get hit by it, and then he looks at you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, little did they know I could have murdered them very early on in the campaign. Sure, <laughs> yeah. All right, so we're coming up on time. 
Uh, James L. Sutter, where can people find your work and what you're doing lately? Well, please, uh, you know, obviously everybody can always find me on Twitter. I love interacting with people there. Um, I'm on it more than I should be, probably. Um, You know, you can also find at jameslsutter.com is where I have, uh, again, you know, all my short fiction, much of which you can read for free, Um, my novels, my comics, my music, stuff like that. Um, I should also mention I've also started teaching online classes in Mm -hmm. world building. And so I did one of those uh, a couple months ago via the uh, the Cat Rambo Academy for Writers, um, and it's a two day uh, two day course. So it's two hours on two different Saturdays, um, and it was really fun. Like the people, uh, you know, it's it's basically just me trying to boil down into four hours everything I've learned about how to world build, especially on a deadline. And so it's less about let's have these big, you know. Uh, musing ideas and take this inspiration to still it. And it's like, okay, what do you do when you have an hour and you need to turn this in? And it's especially good for freelancers. <laughs> um, but like, how do you kickstart your brain when you're feeling uninspired and how do you do it quickly? Um, because that's one of the best skills that this job has taught me is how to, <laughs> how to invent things that you're going to like later on when you have, half an hour and a thousand words and you just you just have to get it done because that book's going to print Mm -hmm. um so it's basically four hours of all of my tips and tricks but uh, i'm going to be running another one this summer in june so if anybody's interested in signing up for that that you can find that on my website as well um but yeah that's that's about it okay any other shout outs from the rest of the crew i got Uh, my art today for stellar Oh, yes, the backers, uh, our backers, our insider backers have gotten a sneak peek of the art for our upcoming actual play podcast where we're going to be playing through, oh gosh, which one are we playing Against through? Against the Aeon Throne. Against, Against the Aeon, the Aeon Throne. Throne. Nice. Against the Aeon Throne uh, with so uh, Vanessa from the network G Elming and Amanda Hemmen Coons joining us as a guest player through it. Oh, sweet. Yeah. It's going to be awesome. The crew is turning out exceptionally weird and most of them have fur. Um, I am playing a, a... I think only two of us have fur. I think it's just me and you. Oh, okay. Cause Amanda's <laughs> character is, is, is covered in chitin. Okay. And, I didn't know if bugs Lauren... counted as covered in fur or not. I don't know. Literally. No, that would make them mammals. Oh, well, that, that, <laughs> and, yeah, and James and uh, Lauren are playing human brother and sisters. Mm, so, nice. Yeah, mm-hmm. yep, we, yep. we've got we've got a really weird weird crew. I think it's going to be funny. Mm-hmm. Yep. That so, is what this game is for, man. That mm-hmm. was a that was a guiding light in this game was we needed people to be able to play weird characters. You know, Eric Mona very early on was saying you need to be able to be the alien, and I agree one hundred percent. Yeah, so the weirder the crew, the more true to the spirit of the game, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, good. That's <laughs> excellent to hear. Thank you for supporting us. Yeah. Uh, um, sorry, ahead, I just had a link to Mepicon, which is a convention ha- happening up in Scranton on April the 14th, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, 12th to the 14th. Um, I can put the link in the Discord as well. They're still looking for GMs, and they also have a bunch of player slots, too, if you want to you know, a good weekend of a fun games. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Go get everyone in the area. Go check that out. See if it's something you want to do. It sounds like a lot of fun. As always, we would like to direct everyone to go to NoDirectionPodcast.com, the website where you can find this and all of our fantastic content, including our many and growing number of podcasts. Um, they're, they're producing <laughs> like rabbits lately. And then we also have our fantastic blog articles, including two blogs written by Alexander Agunas and, of course, James over here, who writes Code Switch, which are both brilliant blogs. You need to read them. Oh, also on the subject of blogs, I'll just put in another plug for everybody to go check mm-hmm. out the Paizo blog tomorrow, because Thursdays are when the uh, the new fiction about the Pathfinder characters oh. drops. So Ooh. you check so, in tomorrow. That's going to be Harsk's mm-hmm. moment to shine, I believe. Mm-hmm. So. His yeah. first and only? <laughs> well, oh. I don't know. Uh, 
Uh, I mean, he was in the comics. He was in the comics a little bit. You, but, you have uh, to remember that we play in Pathfinder Society, where his build, his character pre-gen build, is notoriously oh. bad. Oh well, then you are definitely going to want to read the fiction tomorrow. Yeah. He Good. retrained. Uh, Good. I know he literally dropped the crossbow. That was what he needed. He <laughs> in in Pathfinder Society, he had a heavy crossbow, but he could only load it as a full action. So he so he couldn't actually like shoot an attack at the same time at yeah. level seven it was really not a great <laughs> all right uh, uh also on no direction podcast.com you can find the link to our discord server which we encourage all of you to go if you want to hang out with the most chill and least toxic pathfinder starfinder community on the internet you can go there and hang out with all our fans chat with all our staff we're on there pretty much constantly with hundreds of our fans and it's a great place to hang out and talk about all of these wonderful things we talk about on the episodes as right. well we, we need to thank just, oh alex i was i was gonna say we got a kate baker endorsement for how non-toxic and great we are and she made morla mal so you should listen to her yes nice. <laughs> <laughs> all right so also we want to thank our patreon backers it's only through your support that podcasts like no direction beyond stellar our upcoming stellar actual play podcast adventurous our pathfinder actual play podcast and the many other projects we've got going on at no direction can happen if you want to support the network and and you know get some neat bonuses like our unconditioned cards as well as if you back high enough, access to the insider's room on the Discord server where you find out what we're doing while it's still in the planning stages. Mm -hmm. You can do so at the Patreon link on our website or going to patreon.com slash no direction. Again, only if you all can support us, uh, no huge pressure, but it really does help keep us going. Param's button box is the greatest investment. I know, that button box. Thank you all for the button box. The button box is great. And it was only possible thanks to your support on your Patreon. All right, I think that gets everything. So, until next time, go beyond with no direction. <laughs>